This is a very special Shabbat. And it's a very special weekend for our country as we mark the incredible legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And for many years on this Shabbat, we have invited guest speakers who could uh, share with us their understanding of that legacy and the work that they do that exemplifies the unfolding, the continuing unfolding of that legacy which we still need so very much in our country where racism, injustice, poverty, and so many of the things that Dr. King struggled for and addressed in his life, short life. Uh, so many of the things that are therefore important in this Shabbat, we have the honor of uh, having the Reverend Dr. John Duxworth with us, who was born here in Harlem, attended New York City Public Schools, he then acquired an associate degree from Dutchess County Community College, a bachelor's degree in liberal arts from State University of New York, a master's degree in professional studies from New York Theological Seminary with a concentration in counseling. There's more degrees. A master's degree in public administration. He is an avid learner from John Jay College of Criminal Justice with a concentration in management and organization. And in 2022, he earned his doctorate of ministry degree from New York Theological Seminary. In 1985, Dr. Duxworth went to work for the Salvation Army in East Harlem. And after four years, he elected to become a Salvation Army officer, was admitted to the school for officer's training. In 1990, he graduated, ordained, and commissioned to the rank of lieutenant, and later promoted to the rank of captain. He has served as an officer in Philadelphia, in Brooklyn, many other places, including Boston. And after 17 years with the Salvation Army, he resigned his ordination and commission. He has provided leadership to court-based programs, community corrections, probation, and juvenile justice agencies, private corrections corporations, and social services agencies in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. His various roles have expanded from experiential to providing direct service to middle and senior management positions to government agency executive team. He's a licensed trainer in restorative justice principles and practices from the International Institute of, of, Restorative, of Restorative Practices, as well as a, train, a trained uh, in MAAT Training Institute for Restorative Justice in Washington, D.C. Community Justice of Youth Institute in Chicago, University of Minnesota, and the U.S. Department of Justice. You can believe that he has credentials in restorative justice. This man knows it inside and out. And he is currently the director of the Restorative Justice Project of the Children for Children's Advocacy. And he has been the recipient of numerous awards. He has published and he's married to Joan, and they have two teenage daughters. Good luck with that. <laughs> and, and we are honored to have you here, the Reverend Dr. John Duxworth. As you were reading, good morning. Um, rabbis, thank you for having me. To the congregation, thank you for having me. I will definitely change my bio after today. <laughs> 
at best, I tell, I tell my friends, I'm just one hungry beggar trying to tell another beggar where there's a plate to eat. You know, credentials, I believe we live in a credential society, it's true. But as I worship with you this morning, I'm reminded of a, of a number of things. One, I'm reminded of what it's like to be a stranger in a foreign land. Uh, and I would like to thank the gentleman who was sitting behind me. Um, I don't know your name, I won't remember it after today, but thank you for guiding me in terms of which text to use. Um, I worship in a lot of settings, and I am of the Christian faith, and I, I, I worship in a Protestant uh, worship service weekly. But again, being here this morning with you, I've already been blessed. I have been blessed by your music, by your fellowship, by your crossing in, young lady, to, to new beginning for you. All of those things are just so important. And sometimes we forget them. Sometimes we take them for granted. Sometimes we think that they're not important. And yet these things, these symbols, these tokens of our faith are ever so important. And as people of faith, we cannot afford to put them down. Now, none of that is in the sermon. <laughs> but um, we, can't afford to, we can't afford to forget them, push them aside. It is in our best, it behooves us to always keep these symbols uplifted. I don't think I understood 10 words that were said this morning, but I was jamming to the music, <laughs> okay? okay? You know, I was jamming to the music and there's no doubt in my mind that God the creator was being praised. There is no doubt in my mind we weren't talking about the scores from the Knicks or how many runs the Yankees were scored. We were talking about a God that we serve, a God that we give thanks to, a God that we are grateful for, and a God that we need in life. So I thank you for having me here this morning with you. Now, I'm charged with talking about Dr. King and um, Rabbi Felicia told me the fact that you were in the book of Exodus. I will concede. I'm a junkie for the book of Exodus. Okay, definitely my favorite book of the Bible. The idea, the theme of bondage, wilderness in the promised land. I could talk about that until six o'clock tonight and only need to stop for a glass of water and continue again. So much of my own life is, is caught up in, in, into that theme, into that story of bondage, wilderness, in a promised land. <sighs> On Monday, we will observe the birthday of Dr. King, born January 15, 1929. If he were alive today, he would be 95 years old. There were times in my life, from a historical perspective and from a social perspective, I am glad that he died. And what do I mean by that? Because sometimes the world can be so cruel to our heroes Sometimes our heroes themselves can make a misstep and cloud up everything they've done. So I don't, was he a perfect man? No. Did he walk the water? No. But when I think of Dr. King, I, I think of being a change agent. I think of someone who used his faith to make a way for me, for you, and everyone in the human race. I think of a good man. And sometimes we can't keep that, run that kind of race. I, I, he was, his father, bear with me, because I'm, I'm not used to wearing. <laughs> um, 
I will try to tell you something about Dr. King that you may not know or you won't pick up on CNN tonight. His father was a Baptist minister. Uh, his father established Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Um, and if you've ever been to Atlanta and you see Ebenezer now, it's a whole campus. But the truth about it is it started in a very small building that's still there on the corner, but nothing like what you see Ebenezer today. But anyway, in 1934, uh, King, Dr. King Sr. went to Berlin with the, United, with the United Baptist Association. And he, there he became exposed to an earlier Protestant by the name of Martin Luther. So he was so impressed, the father, with Martin Luther that he, he came back to the United States and he changed his name. His father's given name was Michael King Sr. When he came back, first thing he did, he changed his name to Martin Luther King. And he also changed his son's name. He was six years old, and he changed his name to Martin Luther King. And that's the man that we know. That's the legacy that he, know, we, that he has left us behind. Now also at that conference in Berlin, his father wrote a statement, a resolution, along with other members of the Baptist Congregation, a Baptist Congress, and it says, this Congress deplores and condemns as a violation of the law of God, the Heavenly Father, all racial animosity and every form of oppression or unfair discrimination towards Jews, towards colored people, or subject races in any, pa in any part of the world. I'm not quite sure it would be socially, socially correct today, but I think you understand um, the point that was made in 1930, 19, 1934. And we all know that in 1968, Dr. Keene was assassinated. He was the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. He was the recipient of a host of awards, the Montgomery Bus Boycott, the Southern Christian Leadership, where I become introduced to him in my own journey, the 1963 March on Washington. I will tell you in 1963, the March on Washington, growing up in New York City, in hearing busloads of congregations talk about, we have to go to Washington. Yeah, we have to be there. I have to confess, I had no idea the impact that that day would have. It was a bus trip. It was an opportunity to, to get on a bus and go to DC with some relatives. However, it is one of those benchmark days in my own life that I can say changed the world. And as there are a number of people, as I look around the congregation, their hair is the same as mine, their walk is the same as mine, I can say to you, I don't think any of us had any impact what that day would have on that day. But it is one of those days, one of those benchmark days that I would put down in history as helped change the world. Not the only day, but one of those days. And then I think about the passing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and voter registration. Those were key days in, in, in my youth. But at this point in my life, we, do you realize, I'm sure we do, that there are over 19 states in the United States right now that are trying to change their vote, voting rights, that everyone doesn't have the right to vote. If you're old enough, you, you might remember people, voices like Mike Wallace on CBS. 
at the news, and that's, that's before 60 Minutes became so big. And every day you, you would see people uplifting the right to, the simple right to vote. At 12 and 13, I didn't understand it. But I hope that our 12 and 13, my 13 year old daughter understands the power of the vote. I hope your 13 year old daughters and your 13 year old sons understand the power of the vote. Let us not take these moments for granted. I, I am not going to stay exclusively on Dr. King. I think most of us here in the audience are mindful of his presence and what he's done and what his work continues to do and his legacy. I'd like to take a few moments to talk about the biblical story of bondage, wilderness, and the promised land, the story of Exodus, and how it lives today. One of the, in his book, Never Abandon Hope, uh, Reverend Ed Muller talks about there are three things that come out of oppression. There are three things that come out of bondage. And those three things are, you are physically bound. You become radically dependent. And you begin to believe, you become convinced that there is no hope. Now in my adult life, um, I work with men who right now are serving life in prison with no hope of parole. I work with juveniles who are as young as 11 years old, who have been arrested 10, 11, 12 times. But I also believe this, I say this in other settings, most juveniles who are victimizers, they have been victimized first. They didn't start out becoming the victimizer. They are responding to being victimized themselves. So for those of us, let, let's keep that balance alive. But that's who I work with. And I see the fact that so much, there is no hope. There is no hope. You know, we, 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 we speak to young people about go to college, get an education, and you'll have the opportunity to have a wonderful life. There's a TV commercial, and this is not in the minutes, in, in, the, in my notes, but there's a TV commercial that's on right now. It says in the 1950s, get a job, buy a house. 1960s, get a job. Anyone else have, seen, have you seen that commercial? I think it's for an insurance company. <laughs> 1950s, get a job, buy a house. 10 years later, another generation, get a job, buy a house. The current generation says, get a job, get some roommates, and rent a house. And the fact that it's, it's designed to, to encourage people that how the system needs to be changed. I, I do believe there are a number of things in, in our system that need to be changed. Our educational system, our healthcare system, our, where I work and live and, and, and reside in our criminal justice system. Um, an old figure. We have more people incarcerated in the United States than any other place in the world. That's old news. Let me give you another number. We have more people under supervision than several combined industrial countries around the world. We have two million people incarcerated in this country. We have seven million people 
an additional 7 million people under some level of supervision, parole, probation, electronic monitoring. That is so criminal. We have taken policies, we have taken rules, and we have converted them into laws. We have people in, in, in this state incarcerated in Sing Sing because they missed a parole interview. Or they showed up late for a meeting with a parole officer. And they don't have to go before a judge. They just are in the system. It didn't come to talk about the criminal justice world. Um, but I, I, I uplift to you that when we look at the work of the Dr. Kings of the world, I, I think that we can take the words of the musical band, The Temptations, coming out of the 60s. The world is a ball of confusion. You know, and um, there's a line in that song that says the only person talking about love thy neighbor is the preacher and the only one seeming ready, interested in and learning is the teacher. That's what the world is today. There is a difference between living without hope and living with no hope. When all suffering and pain are gone, then hope is gone. As long as there is suffering, there is hope. Or Cornel West puts it another way. That is why hope is always stained, is always blood stained and with tears. Because when we have hope, we are still in the game. When we have hope, we are still persevering. We are still pushing forward. We are still trying. When we look at what God has done for the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and as you replay that drama year in and year out or daily, as we are reminded of it, I, I, I say this, and I don't get a dime for saying this. I think the Jewish community has the best handle on understanding that moment in time. Because you're reminded daily, don't forget who let you out of Egypt. Don't ever forget that. And life has taught me, regardless what our faith conviction is, we all have Egypts. Some of our Egypts are called substance abuse. Some of our Egypts are called poverty, despair. Some folks even call marriage e Egypt. <laughs> but whatever your Egypt is. And I, I am happily married this time. <laughs> whatever your Egypt is, you, you clearly understand don't forget who let you out. And I think that is so important. Because the world that we live in today, it is so easy to forget or to even think there is an Egypt. But I would argue that Egypt is alive and well. Are there any school teachers in, in, in the congregation? Okay. <laughs> I am an avid sports fan. I follow the Yankees, I follow the Giants, and I follow the Knicks. I have served all over this country in, in different roles, and before the internet became so prominent, whenever I lived in another city, I bought the New York Daily, the New York Post, just so I could follow the sport teams in, um, in New York. With the internet, you don't have to do that. If you've ever lived in Boston, uh, there's not now, but 
I want to say in the early 2000s, there was a sign as you drive into the city of Boston. It said, if you're a Yankee fan, turn around. <laughs> so I'm a sports fan, big time sports fan. Now in saying that, I do not gamble on sports. But I think it is so criminal that we live in a world that someone who catches a football, throws a football, hits a baseball, can make hundreds of millions of dollars a year and a school teacher has to buy supplies for her classroom. And school teachers have to take a second job to make ends meet in their own household. I think that is so criminal in the world that we live in today. As I began with the idea, and this is what I want to leave you with, and I know that your scripture reading today talks about how Moses and Aaron took the, the Nile and turned the water to blood, and how God allowed the frogs to invade Egypt. I don't, I don't know how to connect that. I don't. You, you, know, I, 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 you know, what it made me think about was how and I'm not a fan, but I'm going to quote him, how Mayor Adams said that so many people were leaving New York because of the rats. Now, I can imagine New Yorkers being flooded with frogs. I, 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 but there's a lesson there. There's a biblical theological lesson there. Uh, but whatever it is, when they taught it, I must have been absent that day. So I'm not going to try to go down that street. But I will say this. It is imperative, I believe, that as people of faith, and I work predominantly in an interfaith world, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. I am glad that God has allowed me to experience and see the need for the interfaith world. I think because of how I live in an interfaith world that I am a better Christian. I, and I don't expect you to, to agree with that, it's okay, but I think, I, I, I thank God for the ability to see the interfaith world. Some of you may have read a book called, and I'm gonna lose his last name, but he's a reporter for the, he was a reporter for the New York Times, and he goes to Harvard and he says, you know, finding God at Harvard. I wanna say Ira, Ira Goldman, if I'm not mistaken, Ira Goldman. When I was teaching a class, I, I used that as one of the texts for the class. It had tre tremendous impact. But anyway, what I wanted to leave you with today is that it is imperative that we as people of faith use our faith principles, use, our, use the power of prayer, and use the power of practice. And I'm not looking for three Ps here, it just work that way. But principles of our faith, practices of our faith, and the prayer of our faith to make the world a better place. I've talked about Martin Luther, but I want to close with another Martin. He writes a poem, and I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with. And he says, when they came for the socialist, I did nothing because I wasn't a socialist. When they came for the liberals, I did nothing because I wasn't a liberal. When they came for the Jews, I did nothing because I wasn't Jewish. But when they came for me, there was no one left. I don't want to end on a sad note because we're here to celebrate. And I celebrate worship, faith, the power of the Almighty to use us to be people of change, to be people of purpose, and be people of grace. God bless you.